Story recapped here. Today I'm going to explain a comedy crime film called War Dogs, based on a true story. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. In the year 2005, David Packhouse is a resident of Miami, Florida. He works as a professional massage therapist who gives sessions to the super rich. During a session with a customer named Gary, he contemplates what he wants out of his life. He wants to see a significant change happen in him, but he has limited resources. Gary intentionally removes the towel while lying down, Miles turns back and sees half of his body completely exposed. For David, this is the last straw. After the session, he tells himself that he has had enough. He spends all his life savings to embark on a new business. He plans on selling quality bedsheets wholesale to all the retirement homes in South Florida. He meets up with a manager from one retirement home. The environment is not that lively as old people fill the space. He tries to persuade the manager into buying his products, but he declines and says that there is not much need to provide premium goods to old people. David leaves the room in a sad mood while carrying a box full of his unsold sheets. At a funeral, one of David's friends comforts him about his failed business venture. From a distance, they spot Ephraim de Verley, David's childhood best friend. They have not seen each other since high school after Ephraim lived with his uncle. Ephraim also sees David, and they greet each other as the ceremony starts. After, they catch up about their lives, and Ephraim invites David to have a ride around the city. He is hesitant at first, but he comes anyway. Ephraim used to buy seized weapons at police auctions and resell them on the internet. However, his uncle deceived him for 70 grand. Because of that, Ephraim decided to move back to Miami and start his own company, A Incorporated. They arrive at a neighborhood where Ephraim usually buys stuff. Ephraim gives them $300, but they pocket the money and ignore Ephraim, showing off a gun to make him leave. Ephraim walks to his car and pulls out a bigger gun from his trunk, which he starts firing off in the air to scare the dealers away. David panics and is frightened that they might get in trouble, but Ephraim assures him that he has a class 3 firearms license. He looks at Ephraim in amazement. David lives with his girlfriend Is. When he gets home, Is notices right away that David is high. They both talk about how their days went and continue to have an intimate moment. The following day, David makes a business call with another manager of a retirement home. He fails to close a deal. David arrives at Ephraim's office, at the moment, Ephraim is busy with a business call, so David just listens on the couch. Ephraim reveals that he supplies guns to the US military. David and Ephraim discuss Ephraim's new line of business, gun running. He explains to David how to exploit the war for profit. David starts to get interested because the line of income is crazy. Ephraim explains the ins and outs of how the Pentagon manages its inventory while negotiating with him. Back in their home is as big news. She is currently pregnant. David is more worried than excited because of their financial situation. He meets up with Ephraim to discuss his problem, he sees his best friend struggling, offering him a job. He persuades David to assist him in his business because he is the only one he could trust. David has second thoughts about the idea because he hates wars and violence. Both he and his wife participate in rallies and sign petitions against the cause. Finally, David agrees to be part of his team. Although the money is good, he hides it from Is. He tells her that he will still sell bedsheets, but instead of retirement homes, he will be selling to the free spending and overfunded US military, which is a lie. David spends the following weeks in a crash course on arms dealing monitored by Ephraim. He familiarizes himself with names and models of weapons. He sneaks out in the middle of the night to work on the phones back in the office. Ralph Slutsky is Ephraim's silent partner. He owns multiple laundry shops across the area. The duo receives funding from him under the false belief that A only sells arms to protect Ralph's country of origin. Inside a nightclub, David tells him that he got on the phone with Henry Girard, an infamous international supplier of weapons. The news amazes Ephraim because he looks up to Henry. That same night, he gets into a fight with a guy after hitting on another man's girlfriend. David and Ephraim land a contract also known as the Beretta deal to provide several thousand Beretta pistols to the United States Department of Defense. It is a weapon adopted by the United States military as their service pistol in 1985. This deal is so rare and 10 times better than their past ones, so they celebrate at a local diner. During a scheduled ultrasound at the hospital, David receives a phone call about the deal. However, they encounter a problem. The Italians have passed a legislation in the past week to ban all arms shipments to Iraq. David has no idea that when they have Beretta shipped on the way to Iraq, Italian-made guns are not being permitted. Failure to deliver the weapons as promised means that A would be blacklisted from any future contracts. David is distressed, but assures Captain Santos that the weapons will be delivered on time. 
is walks out of the ultrasound room to reveal the baby's gender, a girl. The couple hugs each other in happiness. David seeks consultation from Ephraim. They are both at a firing range when he breaks the news. Ephraim is confident that the issue will be resolved smoothly. They decide to ship the Berettas to Jordan, and from there, it can make its way to the U.S. military base. Is and David host a small dinner party with their friends. One of them warns David about being affiliated with Ephraim, saying that he is unstable. Suddenly, Ephraim storms to their house because David did not pick up his phone. He is surprised to see many people, realizing that he was not invited. He excuses David because of an urgent matter. Ephraim tells him that their weapons were seized in Jordan by the customs. The frustrated Captain Santos calls that he wants to nullify their contract. This means the end for them. Ephraim tries to get emotional with Captain Santos but he hangs up on him. While they come up with a solution, Is overhears their conversation and gets mad at David for lying to her and being an arms dealer. David defends the business saying that they are just middlemen and what they do is perfectly legal. Ephraim interrupts them and informs David that they should fly to Jordan as soon as possible. They arrive to Jordan and get straight to business. David rarely gets to travel, so he takes split seconds to glance at the city. They meet with other smugglers to get help in getting permits to transport the weapons. A kid helps them by being a translator in their negotiations. Ephraim bribes the locals $1,400 to release the shipment on their behalf. For three days, they hear nothing from the smugglers, and their business is running on the word of an 11-year-old translator. Ephraim and David thinks that the smugglers ripped them off. While discussing about it, they receive a call, and the plan goes on. They are provided with a driver named Marlboro to transport them and the cargo into Iraq. The trio starts their journey with their truck loaded with high-end weapons. They drive at night, which according to their driver, is much safer. They come across border patrol officers who interrogate them. The soldiers point guns at them, but they instantly calm down and let them go when Marlboro bribes them with cigarettes. David feels so much different than what he did months ago as a massage therapist and rethinks his life choices. They stop at a gas station in Fallujah, where David wakes up and doesn't see Marlboro. He checks if he is inside the building, but he finds a dead body at the abandoned place instead. He rushes to the truck to wake Ephraim up and inform him about the dead body. Ephraim says that it is normal to see that in a war zone. At the moment, Marlboro is siphoning gas for its usage. David receives a call from Iz, who appears to forgive David for lying to her, even though she is highly bothered by it. Meanwhile, he sees a group of vans approaching, with men firing guns at them. David panics, so he honks the horn to alert Ephraim and Marlboro. He struggles to start the car, but it eventually accelerates. Thinking that he will get left behind, Marlboro runs after the truck and loads it with gas as they escape. The trio is saved when a U.S. chopper comes to their rescue, forcing the mercenaries to stop shooting. They excitedly shout in celebration. They arrive safely at the military base, where Captain Santos is impressed that they survived the infamous Triangle of Death. They ask a soldier to snap a picture of them for remembrance purposes. They head to the accounting department of the base, where bundles of cash surround the room which is approximately $12 billion. The agency pays them a large sum of money amounting to $2.8 million, then, they are escorted by the military to the airport and leave Baghdad. The company lands bigger and more money-making deals as days go by. They both buy matching expensive cars and luxurious apartments. Their lives seem to go as planned, even better that it feels like a dream. David even burns all the bedsheets which was a failed venture in the past. Ralph throws a celebration because of big returns in his investment in the company. He even increases his original investment by $10 million. A expands and employs more people to work with as they upgrade their office to a more professional location. At this point, they optimize all the facets of the business to bring it to the next level. David is now a father to baby Ella. He balances the life of being an arms dealer and a father. The company eyes on a chance at the Afghan deal, which will be their most significant so far. The US government posts a massive order worth $300 million, which requires 100 million rounds of AK-47 ammunition and net a 100 million profit. If pursued, this will be A's biggest deal. David and Ephraim head to Vegas X, which is a convention for the latest warfare weapons. Although A's name is not that famous, the duo sees this as an advantage. They put up a more professional front, but they slowly lose hope, because being part of the Afghan deal means that they should reshape the company. At the casino, David encounters the legendary Henry Girard. He calls Ephraim to accompany them for drinks. They all meet each other and have a quick meeting about access to massive unused weapon depots in Albania. Henry has all the supplies to fulfill his Afghan deal, which gives them a great chance. For the price, Henry sells the ammunition at 10 cents per round, 
which is an ideal price for A. Ephraim agrees, despite his friend's discomfort with working with a man on a watch list. He continues to persuade David like he always does, but he still seems unconvinced. The following morning, they seal the deal, but they want to see the merchandise on site before they officially work with Henry. They travel to Albania to secure the ammunition and check if the deal is legitimate. A driver brings them to the site where a group of soldiers welcomes them with a banner, and they continue to tour them around the warehouse. It is filled with piles of weapons, both old and new, which is a storage for the Albanian army. They see the containers of bullets, totaling to 126 million rounds. David and Ephraim are amazed by the abundance of it in the warehouse. They open a case of 40-year-old bullets and Ephraim impulsively makes the deal after testing the ammunitions outside. They make the bid to the US military, and within five months, they land it successfully. Ephraim breaks the news to David while having a picnic by the beach. They embrace each other out of excitement. To pass all government processes, they fabricate A's accounting going back three years. They meet with high-ranking officials to finalize the deal in Illinois. As they negotiate, the duo is overconfident about their offer. The board reveals to them that their prices were meager compared to their competitors. Ephraim learns they severely underbid their competitors by $53 million, causing him to be in a state of rage. At home, Iz becomes extremely tired of David's lies about his job and dirty deals. The tension in their relationship starts to surface. Iz leaves to live with her mother indefinitely. She gets tired of being worried about David and his whereabouts when he goes on a business trip. David persuades her to stay, but she refuses after finding bundles of cash hidden around the house. In their main office, Ephraim uses drugs more often. The stress from the business is getting the most out of him. Meanwhile, David drafts a new contract. Ephraim enters his office a golden grenade as a token of his appreciation. He prints the new partnership agreement with a 70 to 30 split between them. Ephraim feels a sense of rivalry between them but still continues to be excited about the Afghan deal. David arrives at Albania to facilitate the deal and supervise it, while Ephraim parties at Miami. Preparing the shipment in Albania, David discovers that all the rounds originated from China. This stems from a problem because Chinese ammunitions are illegal to a US embargo. In short, they got played by Henry, and he refuses to help them. He does not show a single ounce of concern, and leaves them to deal with the issue. Ephraim comes to Albania to help David with coming up with a solution. To conceal the problem, Ephraim proposes that they repackage the illegal ammunition. David brings up his concerns about the prohibited things that they may encounter. However, Ephraim is convinced that they will be safe, and will get their $300 million deal. Their driver, Boshkim, introduces them to Enver who owns a boxing and storage company. The ammunitions will be transferred from tin boxes and wooden crates to plastic bags for the purpose of lessening its weight. Currently, he has 68,520 crates of ammunitions. They proceed on repacking the ammunition to make it look like it is not Chinese. Enver calculates the cost of repacking everything. He charges them $100,000, which David and Ephraim are very much happy about. They organize a factory that repacks the ammunition with a tremendous workforce. The process will lighten their load by 180 tons, which generates more profit. On Christmas, Ephraim calls David, learning that Henry has charged A a 400% markup, Ephraim plans to cut Henry out of the deal because of his frustration. David and Ephraim get into an argument, the latter destroys the only copy of their partnership contract, leaving all rights to him. That night, a group of masked men kidnaps David from his room. The men beat and threaten him. Henry is behind this after learning about Ephraim's plan to cut him off. He goes back to the factory to grab some stuff before heading back to Miami for a week. David learns that Ephraim did not pay Enver, the Albanian handling manager, the repackaging fee of $100,000. Enver informs David that he knows the real reason for repackaging the ammunition. Before fleeing, the driver's wife approaches David to tell him that he is missing or probably dead. He lands to Miami and goes straight to his to rekindle their relationship. He tells her that he went to Albania to repackage Chinese ammunition so they could disguise and sell it to the US government. He tells her that he will be a massage therapist once again. He is tired of dealing with illegal matters and doing all the work for Ephraim. David storms to the A office angrily. He demands the money he is owed, but his partner refuses, so he quits A. He also threatens to sue Ephraim if he does not get paid. At this point, their friendship is over. Three months later, David returns to working as a professional massage therapist. Ralph approaches him to mediate the situation between him and Ephraim. They offer David a paltry severance package, and David threatens Ephraim with evidence of his falsified company documents. David receives a call from the FBI, and so does Ephraim. 
They both ride the elevator down to meet with the officials. They talk about their severed friendship and the wrong things they have done. Shortly after, the elevator door opens and the FBI arrests them both. They exchange smug looks at each other before entering the cop cars. The FBI had already arrested Ralph, who wore a wire while the three met at the restaurant. David and Ephraim are all over the news after the incident. Ephraim is sentenced to four years in prison for numerous crimes, while David gets seven months of house arrest for his cooperation. Months after, David receives a booking with an anonymous client. He finds out that it is Henry. He apologizes to David for kidnapping him in Albania and expresses his appreciation for not being turned into the FBI by offering him a briefcase of money in exchange for no more questions. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.